In this video, we're going to start looking at examples of polymerization reactions and predict the products of polymerization, also noting where we would expect step growth or chain growth polymerization. And the first example here involves a polymerization between oxalic acid and resorcinol, or 1,3-dihydroxybenzene, catalyzed by acid. And there it is. So we should start, as we typically do here, by drawing the monomer structures and the acid catalyzed conditions and thinking about what's going to go on. So one thing we can notice, for example, is that the oxalic acid has carboxylic acid groups, two of them, and resorcinol has two hydroxyl groups. So resorcinol looks like a dinucleophile with two nucleophilic hydroxyl groups, and oxalic acid looks like a dielectrophile with these two carbonyl groups in it. And so we can think about, under the acid-catalyzed conditions in particular, a Fischer esterification between the hydroxyl groups of resorcinol and the carboxylic acid groups of oxalic acid. And so initially, we can think about making an ester like this. And for example, on one end, we might have a free carboxylic acid group, and on the other end, a free hydroxyl group. And so polymerization can continue off of these two ends, right? Another resorcinol molecule comes in over here, and another molecule of oxalic acid comes in over here, and the chain grows from there. So we continue to do this esterification process. Each esterification involves the loss of a molecule of water, right? This H plus this OH, that's one molecule of water, essentially. And what we end up with here is essentially a polyester, where oxalic acid can make two esters and each resorcinol molecule can make two esters. And so the overall structure looks like this. The repeating unit includes the two carbons of oxalic acid and a molecule of resorcinol and overall a molecule of water has been lost, right, from the two monomers in this repeating unit. And these bonds that sort of bridge the square brackets just continue on the chain. We use subscript n here to represent the n repeating units. Now, in terms of step growth or chain growth, this is an example of a polymerization between two monomers, a dielectrophile and a dinucleophile. So this is a step growth process. And it's going to have, for example, the kinetic characteristics of step growth that we've seen um, previously, where with each reaction event, the chain length is going to grow exponentially. Here we're asked to determine the monomers we would use to prepare this polymer, and it's noted in the question as a condensation polymer. Condensation polymers come from polycondensation reactions, which involves the loss, uh, involve the loss of a small molecule. Water, most commonly, although small alcohols can also be lost in these reactions, and, and water is sort of the simplest to think about here. Now, in, in terms of polycondensation, with the loss of a small molecule like this, typically we want to think about things like acylation, nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions that establish functional groups that are carboxylic acid derivatives, things like esters and amides, for example. And so we see that this polymer is a polyester, and so we can sort of target, thinking in the, the retrosynthetic direction, this CO bond between the carbonyl carbon and this ester sort of alkoxy oxygen as a point of disconnection, right? And we can recognize that I've got something here that resembles a diol, and I've got something here that resembles a dicarboxylic acid, just missing two OH groups, right? And I've got that same original diol monomer built in on the other side here. So we're actually seeing sort of one and a half repeating units in this polymer structure. So to work this backwards, recognizing that condensation in the forward direction involves the loss of H2O, we can add H2O across the CO bond, essentially, of the ester, producing a diol and a dicarboxylic acid as the monomers here. So the diol is, again, a dinucleophile. This diacid is a sort of a dielectrophile. And polymerization would occur in a step growth manner here, which is typical of condensation polymers. In thinking about the various ways that polymerizations can proceed mechanistically, particularly polyaddition polymerizations, we can sort of recognize three different possibilities. The reactive chain end in a chain growth or polyaddition polymerization, for our purposes, they're the same thing, could involve a cation anion or radical. And this gives three kind of general classes of polymerization that we talk about, cationic, anionic, and radical polymerization. We're going to look at a general mechanism for each and a few specific examples of where they come into play and how to recognize when cationic, anionic, or radical polymerization occurs. So let's start with cationic polymerization. 
Cationic polymerization is a polyaddition reaction in which the reactive chain end, that end of the chain that new monomers continuously add to, contains a reactive cation. And to generate that reactive cation, we typically use a Bronsted or Lewis acid initiator. So the idea here is the Bronsted or Lewis acid is electrophilic, as acids are, and so it will pull electrons from the monomer, creating a cation somewhere in the monomer structure which then gets added to by another monomer, and polymerization sort of goes from there. So there's a two-stage st mechanism here where the initiator, say it's just a Bronsted acid, we'll represent that generally as H+, this can also be a Lewis acid, reacts with the monomer to create some cation inside the monomer. That HM plus cation can then add some number of monomer molecules to create the growing polymer chain with a cation on the reactive chain end. So how does this actually manifest itself in practice? Well, it's very common for cationic polymerization to involve the polymerization of unsaturated groups like CC double bonds or CO double bonds. For example, we can imagine protonating the carbonyl group of a ketone, for instance. This creates a situation where the carbonyl carbon is now more electrophilic, and so another ketone carbonyl oxygen, which is nucleophilic, can add there repeatedly through repeated nucleophilic addition steps, and we end up with a polymer chain that is a polyether with a cation on the end, this cation belonging to that last monomer molecule that added in the uh, sort of last step before we decided to stop lengthening the polymer chain here. And so you can see that this, this cation could add yet another monomer. And so Cationic, anionic, and radical polymerization sometimes have this characteristic of being what's called living, in that we could add more monomer and lengthen the chain, which is, is pretty neat. It's, it's almost like the reaction mixture is alive with this reactive intermediate. So if you want to lengthen the chain, all you have to do is add more monomer, and the reaction mixture will quote-unquote eat up the monomer. It's living in that sense, right? It consumes monomer as it's added because there's always a little bit of this reactive cation around. We can also imagine this for carbon-carbon double bonds, and this is very typical of activated electron-rich alkenes that have an electron donating group connected to one of the two carbons. So this enol ether, for example, is quite nucleophilic at this carbon. We could draw resonance structures involving electron flow like this to show that. And after protonation of one of the monomer molecules, well, now we have an electrophile at this carbon, which looks a lot like a carbonyl carbon, right? Note the CO double bond and positively charged oxygen. This is highly analogous to the situation above. And a neutral enol ether molecule can add repeatedly to this um, thing that looks almost like a protonated carbonyl through repeated nucleophilic additions. And we get a polymer chain like this with, with, again, a cation hanging off the end. And here I've drawn the resonance form with all atoms satisfying the octet rule, but you can imagine there's an alternative resonance form of this with positive charge at this carbon highlighted in blue, showing that a nucleophile can add there repeatedly. Epoxides can also engage in cationic polymerization after protonation of the epoxide oxygen. This makes the carbons attached to that positive formerly uh, positive O, more electrophilic, and so another epoxide molecule can come in, add there in an SN2 kind of step, and that can happen repeatedly to create a polyether structure. So another epoxide molecule could come in at this point, for example, and add that newly electrophilic carbon there, and this happens over and over and over again to create a polyether structure here. And again, we have an electrophilic carbon hanging off the end of the polymer chain. And so this too could add yet another molecule of monomer. For, and we can imagine, for example, if we added more epoxide, we could lengthen the polymer chain. Cationic polymerizations typically work best with alkenes when the alkene is electron rich, linked to an electron donating group. This makes the monomer more nucleophilic, so more reactive with cations in general, but also stabilizes the cation on the end of the growing chain, which prevents side reactions that might terminate chain growth at an early stage, which tends to be undesirable. And so generally what we want, quote unquote, in a monomer for cationic polymerization is an electron donating group linked to one of the alkene carbons. What this does is it creates an alkene that is more nucleophilic than, for example, the sort of parent unsubstituted ethylene, CH2, CH2. And really, the most nucleophilic carbon is this one that's relatively far from the electron donating group. And we can use uh, resonance structures to show that. 
So what ends up happening when we polymerize in the presence of a Bronsted or Lewis base is that nucleophilic carbon becomes linked to the other carbon in the alkene, which is relatively electrophilic, especially after that nucleophilic carbon has been protonated or uh, coordinates to the Lewis acid in the initiation stage. Notice also that the electron donating group stabilizes the cation that's on the growing chain end. And the advantage here is this prevents side reactions of that cation. If that cation is highly reactive, it could, for example, add solvent or do some other kind of reaction that terminates chain growth, leading maybe not to a polymer at all, right? Leading maybe to an oligomer or a polymer that's not as long as we want, or if we want a living polymerization, but the cation keeps getting used up. These are all undesirable. And so stabilizing the cation by putting an electron donating group on the chain end is advantageous. So as a rule, nucleophilic alkenes are going to be better in cationic polymerization. And we'll see shortly that electrophilic alkenes are best for anionic polymerization because of their anion stabilizing properties and their relatively high electrophilicity as neutral monomers.